Good morning. It's a pleasure to see everybody here this morning. I'm glad you're able to make it on this beautiful sunny day. Seven days makes one week. Is that news to anybody? How about this? Seven days without Jesus makes one week. Is that news to anybody? title of today's message, Look and Live. What have you been looking at lately? What gets the focus of your attention each and every day? What catches your eye and holds your gaze? The story is told of an authentic portrait. In front of the old Trinity Christian uh, Baptist Church stands a statue of Phillips Brook, the great preacher of that church. Behind the figure is another figure with his hand resting on the shoulder of the preacher. The story is told of a lady who walked by, stopped to look at the statues and I know who Dr. Brooks is, but who is that behind Dr. Brooks? To which an onlooker paused and said, oh, that's a picture of Jesus. To which the woman responds, it doesn't look like Jesus. Do you know what he looks like? Have you spent enough time with him that if you saw him, you would recognize him? Is your relationship with Jesus so strong and so well-developed that if you passed him on the street, you would indeed recognize him? Or would it just be another face in the crowd? If you want to turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 21, we're going to hang out there for a bit, and uh, so I'll give you a head start. Um, Numbers chapter 21. Let's bow our heads for another word of prayer. Father in heaven, We thank you for this Sabbath. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine that you've given us. We thank you that we can come here and worship you in peace. Please come now. Join us here. You have promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, you will be in their midst. So, Father, please come. Join us in this service today is my prayer. Speak through me. Speak to me. Anoint our ears that we may indeed hear your word and not mine, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In Numbers 21, we find the story of King Arad who attacked the Israelites as they were journeying through the wilderness, and he took some of them captive. The people cried out to God that they might go and fight and have victory over him. And God gave them the victory. But right after crying out, the next thing we read about the Israelites uh, after their victory is them complaining against God and Moses. Look at 21, verse 5. So the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we are disgusted with this miserable food. First of all, what is this miserable food that they are so disgusted with? Manna. I don't know about you guys, but I I would like to taste some manna. And I don't think it would be disgusting. Now, before we get too hard on the Israelites, though, for complaining and grumbling about manna, what blessings have you experienced that you take for granted and you are not thankful for? Is it the old clunky car that you drove to church with the check engine light on that's been on for the past three years, but it still got you here? Or maybe it's the neighborhood you live in. People are very, very bad. Things are always getting stolen, but nothing has ever come up missing from your place. Or maybe it's the house. The wind blows, and you feel the chill, and the furnace comes on, and then you feel the dollar bills coming out of your wallet. But who gave you the dollar bills in the first place so that you could pay the gas bill? Who blessed you with that house and the furnace 
so that you weren't sleeping out in the cold without a furnace. Instead of looking at all the bad things in your life, why don't we take time to look at the good things that we have? And then praise the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the gifts that they have blessed you with. The children of Israel were complaining about their miserable food and poor living conditions. They never stopped to think about how blessed they really were by God's divine protection over them as they walked through the wilderness. They had plenty to eat. No one was going hungry. But the blessing to them was miserable. They were not satisfied with what they were given. Because of their complaining and lack of faith, God withdrew his blessing, his hand of protection. He pulled it away. Numbers 21, verse 6 says this, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. They had been walking in that wilderness for nearly 40 years to at this point and in 40 years had not suffered an attack from a wild animal of the desert. The creatures were living in the desert the whole time. It's not that they weren't there. It's that God's hand was protecting them. Amen. But by complaining and grumbling against God and showing a lack of faith in his abundant blessing, God removed his protection. And then those creatures that had been there all along came out of the woodwork. When they saw the withdrawal of the hand of mercy and they realized the mistake they had made, verse uh, 21, verse 7 says this, So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord that he will remove the serpents from us. Now, it's interesting how God saves them from their predicament. Let's look at Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9. Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9. I think most of you are there, so you're ahead of me. Good job. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and put it on a flagpole, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten and looks at it will live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on the flagpole. And it came about that if a serpent bit someone and he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. God gives them an image, a replica of the very thing that is causing them trouble to look at. And it is only by looking at this thing that resembles the terror of their camp, that they can be saved. Of course, it's not the thing, nor is it the look that does the saving. What it is, is an expression of faith that says, I will look and I will trust him to heal. That is where the healing comes from. If they had been bitten by the serpent, they simply needed to look to the flagpole in the middle of the camp and see a serpent made of bronze hanging there and trust the Father to be faithful to his word and they would live. Look and live. You and I have been bitten by the serpent. The only hope for us is to look and to live. Turn with me to Genesis 3 and verse 1. Genesis 3 and verse 1. Get an amen when you're there. Genesis 3 and verse 1. Genesis 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Just like the Israelites had, been, had to look to the serpent to live, we too must look to the one who was hung on a cross to live. 
We have not been bitten physically, but we have been bitten spiritually. We now have the uh, serpent's poisonous venom running through our veins. The only chance for us to be healed of the serpent's poison is to look to Christ and live. You must look to the one who hung on the cross if you want to live. Turn with me to Romans 3, verse 23. Romans 3, verse 23. Get an amen when you're there. Romans 3, 23. Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, all have sinned. All have been bitten by the serpent. We all have the same problem. We will die if we do not look in faith to the one who can heal us. How do I know this is our plight? How do I know that we will die without the look of faith? Turn with me to Romans 6, verse 23. Romans 6, verse 23. Get an amen when you're there. Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You have been bitten, and the bite of sin leads to death. That's what the verse says. There is no escape from certain death. There is nothing on planet Earth that can heal you from the poison of the serpent. The serpent's venom will one day kill you if you do not receive the anti-venom. But praise God, the verse does not stop with death. The verse ends with life, the gift of Jesus Christ. If you look to him in faith, you will live. If you look to him trusting in his promise, you will receive eternal life. Not just life forever, but life forever in his presence. It can be yours if you will simply look to him and trust his promises. The problem is that just like many of the Israelites, if you were to continue reading that story, refused to look to the bronze serpent. And because they did not look, they did not live. There are so many things in this life that take our attention off of the one hanging on the cross. We have too many things to look at, and we get distracted. What do I mean? What is there to look at besides Jesus Christ and him crucified? What else is there? There are bills that need to be paid. There is a spouse that says that she must have all of your attention, or he must have all of your attention. There is a house to buy or a house to build. There are children who need attention, need to be tended to. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. The things are not the problem. The problem comes when the things take our gaze off of him and we begin to focus on the things. Then there's things like reading material. TV shows, multimedia, other things that take our focus from Jesus. And what I'm going to say next is probably going to step on a lot of toes. But please, listen to the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. Before it ever got anywhere near your toes, it was all over my toes. Please, please, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart as only he can. Look at these images with me for a moment. I 
want to ask you a question. These are all pictures from movies. Would you guys bring those movies into this sanctuary and play them? No? Okay. Got another question for you. Got a couple more images. Would you bring these things into the sanctuary and read them? Okay. So what's wrong with bringing these things into the sanctuary? Help me out here. Why are you not going to bring those into the sanctuary? It's God's house. Okay, what else? Not spiritual, frivolous, ungodly. Very good. Of the world. Thank you. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Get an amen when you're there. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that your, the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy that person. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. You don't want to bring that read, those movies and that reading material into this building because it's God's house, because you worship him here. But this is just a building built by men. This building will one day burn in the destruction of the world. But you don't want to bring those things in here. But what did Paul say in verse 17 and in verse 16? You are a holy temple of God. So why is it that you cannot bring that stuff in here but you have no problem bringing it into your house as you sit on your sofa at home. Or you go out to the theater and you watch those things that you just told me you would not bring in here. Or you go to somebody else's house and you watch those things that you say are frivolous and ungodly and worldly. If you, each one of you, are a temple created in the image of God himself, and you are unwilling to bring those things into this building that is built by men, why are you going to put the same stuff that you will not bring in here into God's holy temple created by God himself, namely, your mind? Turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians 4, verse 8. Philippians 4, verse 8. Get an amen when you're there. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is right, if anything be worthy of praise, think on these things. Question for you. Can you watch a movie without thinking about it? Can you watch a movie without thinking about what it is that you are watching? Can you read a novel or the National, National Enquirer without thinking about what it is that you are reading? Can you read something without thinking about what it was? Go to the store and look at the book section, look at the movie section. Of all the stuff there, the movies and the reading material, All of the stuff, is it something that comes from above that will uplift? Or is the majority of that stuff the invention 
of the serpent. When you get to heaven, do you anticipate walking into the heavenly theater and sitting down and watching Spider-Man or Iron Man or some romance movie from Hallmark? When you get to heaven, do you plan to go to the heavenly bookstore and pick up a juicy novel or maybe the heavenly inquirer instead of the national inquirer? Turn with me to James 4 and verse 4. James 4 and verse 4. Get an amen when you're there. James 4 and verse 4. James 4 and verse 4. Get an amen when you're there. James 4 and verse 4. You adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you are watching worldly movies, if you are reading worldly reading material, then you have hostility towards God. What did the text say? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself or herself an enemy of God. Now, if you have someone who is hostile towards you, do you spend time with them? Do you get together and hang out, barbecue? So why, if you are not willing to hang out with someone who is hostile towards you, you are willing to spend time with something that is hostile towards your creator and maker? Why, if you will not hang out with someone who is hostile to you, are you willing to put things in your mind that lead you away from him? Turn with me to Romans 2 and verse 12. Romans 2 and verse 12. Get an amen in me there. Romans 2 and verse 12. I'm sorry, got that backwards. Romans 12 and verse 2. Romans 12 and verse 2. Romans 12 and verse 2. Get an amen when you're there. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by renewing your mind. How can you be transformed? How can you renew your mind? If you look to the one who loves you and died to save you, you will live. If you will find time to spend with him, with this book, you will find that your mind is renewed. You will begin to desire the holy, wholesome things of God instead of the things of this world. If you choose daily to look to the one who hung on the cross, your mind will be renewed. Remember last time I was here we talked about GIGO, G-I-G-O, the computer term, garbage in, garbage out. If what you put into your mind is not pure, is not true, is not honorable, is not right, is not lovely, is not commendable, is not praiseworthy, then you are not looking to live. You are looking at the things of this world which will perish. Turn with me to Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Get an amen when you're there. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. I'm giving you guys a little extra time because I've had some who say I go too fast. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. 
The eye is the lamp of the body. So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light that is in you is dark, how great is the darkness? If what you are filling your mind with is not the truth of God's word, is not the holy, wholesome things that will draw you closer to him, then what is it? You are filling your mind with darkness. And Jesus says that if the light that is in you is dark, how dark indeed is it? The things of this world might seem bright and shiny as we gaze upon them. They may seem appealing to us, but in the end, it is only darkness. Jesus said the eye is the lamp of the body, right? What does a lamp do? A lamp gives light. The purpose of a lamp is to illuminate, correct? So if the light from the lamp that you are using is not light at all, how are you able to see your way through this dark, sin-filled world? Now, I, I wanted to give you guys an illustration. So I got this, and I brought the box just because I had to show you. This says heat lamp. You guys in the front row, can you see that? It says heat lamp. Heat lamp, right? A lamp, we said, does what? It gives light. Okay. So this is a really cool lamp. And I want you guys to see how well it works. You might want to put your sunglasses on. Wait a minute. See how bright that is? It has a little tiny LED here that you can see is red so that you can tell it is on. But how much light are we getting from this lamp? Set that there. This is a lamp by name. You would expect to see light from it, right? But just like the movies and the reading material and all the other things that are of this world that promise to deliver something, they fall very short of what they claim to be. It does not actually make light. So how can it be a lamp? If you were in a storm in the middle of the night and you heard a big crash, would you go running and grab this so you could go find out what the crash was? Well, the thing I have to tell you today is you are in the midst of a storm. Jeremiah 25, verse 32 says this. Evil is going out from nation to nation, and a great storm is being stirred up. Now, I'm going to go ahead and turn this thing off because it does make heat. It just does not make light. Do you want this lamp to light your way through the storms of life? This light represents all of the attractions of this world. The movies, the TV shows, the novels, anything else that you have that comes between you and Christ. Anything that will pull your gaze off of him and onto it is represented by this light. Now, it's not that you didn't spend time with him. You got up in the morning and you, be with me through the day, and out the door you went. Or maybe you even spent an hour or two studying your Bible. But did you stay focused on him through 
the day. While reading a novel or watching a movie or scrolling through whatever it is that you happen to be scrolling through, are you focused on him? Or are you focused on what's in front of you? Are you still looking to Jesus while you're watching that movie or reading that book or magazine article? Let's take the story of Peter in Matthew 14 and verse 30. Peter is walking on the water. And he is looking to Jesus. But then for just a moment, he stops looking at Jesus. And what happens? He begins to sink. Now, it is not that he did not spend time with Jesus. He had spent the entire day with Jesus, listening to him, talking to him. And yet, the moment that he looked away, he began to sink. Now, is it because Jesus failed him? Not at all. It's because he failed to look to Jesus. He stopped looking at Jesus and started looking at things instead. Again, movies, books, TVs, it doesn't matter what it is because this story is a clear example of something that is perfectly okay to look at and even enjoy, except when it takes your focus away from Jesus. Now, I did do something. I figured you guys would be kind of bored with that light. So I, I, I brought another light. We'll see, what, how, we'll see how this one works. You might want to try the sunglasses this time. If that gets to be too much for you, let me know. Well, we'll move it over here so they can enjoy it then. Because <laughs> I can't see my screen if I put it on top. <laughs> That's what I said. If it gets to be too much for you, let me know. Okay. So now, which lamp are you going to choose to help you to navigate the storm of life. When you hear that crash in the middle of the night and you jump out of bed to go find out what it was, which lamp are you going to take with you? Psalms 119, verse 105 says this, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This book will light your way through the storms of life so that you can safely make it to the other side. When the storms that we talked about in Jeremiah 25, 32 come, which light are you going to be holding? Do you want Instagram, Facebook, or whatever other form of social media that you use? Do you want movies and TV shows, novels and magazines? Or do you want to look to the true source of light? Do you want to look to Jesus Christ? Matthew 24, 24, Jesus says, that the things that are going to come on this world are going to deceive, if possible, the very elect. Brothers and sisters, that's y'all sitting here. Okay, You are going to be deceived if you don't have the light. What is your surety that when the storm of life hits that will deceive the very elect, you will not be left in the darkness? Your only hope is found 
in the look of faith to the one who loves you and died to save you. Turn with me to John 3, 14 and 15. John 3, 14 and 15. Get an amen when you're there. John 3, 14 and 15. John 3, 14 and 15. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes will have eternal life in him. Just as the children of Israel looked to the serpent, by faith received healing. You and I today must look to the Son of God hanging on the cross and in faith accept that he has paid the penalty for your sin and mine. And we, too, will live. It is only when you look in faith to the one who holds all power that there can be a change in your life. It is only by looking to Jesus Christ that the snake venom running through your veins can be purged. There is no power in the things of this world. The power is in the faithfulness of the one who holds all power, namely Jesus Christ. The power is in the faithfulness of the one who holds all power. Jesus Christ. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10.31. 1 Corinthians 10.31. Get an amen when you're there. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for yourself. What? Did I misread that? Do it all to the glory of God. Amen. When you sit to watch something, or when you pull out your phone to start scrolling, or when you sit down to read something, I want you to ask yourself three questions. When you sit down and you're going to watch a movie, read a book, look through your phone, whatever it is you're going to do, I want you to ask yourself three questions. Questions. Are you ready? Question number one. Would Jesus sit here and enjoy doing with me what I am doing, or would he turn away as to not let his mind be tempted? Would Jesus sit here right next to me and join me in what I am doing, or would he turn away as to prevent himself from being tempted? Question number one. Question number two. Is this something that all of heaven would join me in doing? Question number two. What I am getting ready to do, is this something that all of heaven would join me in this activity that I am getting ready to start in? And question number three. Is this thing that I am getting ready to do preparing me for the day that I will meet my Savior face to face? Or will I be ashamed of what I am preparing to do when I do see him? Question number three. This thing that I am getting ready to do, is it preparing me to see him face to face? Or when I see him, will I be ashamed of what I am doing? John 3.16. Everybody say it with me. I know you know it. For God so loved the world... All right, now what about verse 17? How many of you know 17? For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. Will you look to the one who loves you and died to save you, that you might live? Or will you keep looking to the dark things that the serpent is hoping that you will look at 
that are represented by nothing bright. You have a choice to make. Choose the things of this world and die with poisonous venom in your heart. Or you can look at Jesus Christ. You can choose life. Choose wisely. Your eternal destiny rests on the choice that you make today.